Hey everybody, welcome to the first lecture in the Intro to Interior Design Lecture and Learn series. Um, this lecture is going to be focused on what is interior design. Uh, it is a profession, it's a practice, but it's also a passion, as many of you know. Um, you're probably coming into the program with this passion, and you will be leaving not only with this passion, but also with the practice and the profession behind you as you start your careers. Um, so I'm really excited for this lecture and for this class. This lecture in particular will be um, a survey outline of a lot of interior design. And some of the topics we will explore much deeper throughout the class. And a lot of the topics you will have specific classes that focus just on those. I will let you know when we talk about those topics, if you can look forward to a class uh, in your future years or potentially another lecture or assignment based on that topic. If you, if we come across a topic or any area of interest that you would like to talk about more or have a little bit more explanation um, or wonder how you can incorporate more of this into this course or any of your interior design courses, please um, let me know. This would also be a great type of comment to add to the discussion board um, when you can work it in. So here's our agenda for the day. First, we will take care of some announcements, some housekeeping, um, and then we are going to talk about the profession, practice, and passion. And there are subcategories within each one of those um, to really give you a full, well-rounded view of interior design, um, especially the interior design perspective from this program and from accredited programs. And then at the end of the lecture, we will look at the week ahead. So we have some to-do items for week two, which is this week. Um, and then we have assignment one, which will be due next week. Um, so we will go over those and uh, yeah, let's begin. So the first announcements. Um, I just wanna go over again the format of this class. I know it's super confusing. Um, Western is, <laughs> the administration doesn't always understand how classes run or studio classes. And um, not every class is you know, a one hour lecture of accounting. <laughs> so our, the format of the classes in our program are usually a little bit different than um, what your administration and advising and registration fully understand. So it is um, inevitable that there is going to be miscommunication or um, a misunderstanding of schedules, uh, registration details, what have you. Um, and so definitely when we needed to analyze how to incorporate the social distancing and COVID guidelines into the class. Um, that was primarily the role of administration and facilities. Um, as faculty, I am the expert. I am teaching you the content. Um, I did not organize the course or set up the um, e-learning classroom unless it's related to the content. Um, I can help facilitate you um, receiving the help you need if you have any problems whatsoever, but I might not always fully uh, be able to help you directly, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so going back to the format of this class, um, this class has a lecture component, which normally is one hour a week in person. Um, all the students come together in the classroom and uh, they have a one hour lecture of a related topic that they're working on in studio, um, which if you read the syllabus, then you know when I say studio, I mean your lab sections. Um, and then after the lecture, all the students are divided into these lab sections and meet um, once a week for this class for two hours. And during that time, um, it is essentially a work time. 
And so you would be sitting at your desk, you would have received your assignments, your projects, um, you would be receiving tutorials and instruction, a more hands-on style. Um, and so as we are more remote right now, and it is unknown if past week three will be in person or not, um, if we still are in person and uh, the interior design COVID count um, hasn't exponentially increased, we will meet in person. Um, but I do want to take your safety into consideration. Um, and if you have any thoughts or feelings about this whole situation, feel free to reach out to me. I totally understand. Um, college is confusing enough. Plus, the format of our classes are different than everybody's used to. And now we have um, health risks. So it's a crazy world. And there's a lot of social unrest. Um, and being a big university, of course, all of the political uh, and social issues going on in the world have definitely happen on our campus as well. Um, so we are our own little community, <laughs> um, which is which is why I also encourage you to get involved um, with campus events altogether. In um, I think next week sometime, I am going to have some of our senior students either do a pre-recorded introduction or maybe meet with us live. Um, to give just a brief overview of IDSO, which is the Interior Design Student Organization. Um, it's essentially a extracurricular interior design club, but it is related to professional associations. Um, so there is a small fee, but there are a lot of benefits, which they will outline to you um, when they, when we get them scheduled, <laughs> um, normally they would stop into our classes and talk to everybody. Um, but we, we will still make sure to get that, that experience in a digital version. Um, and so, yeah, this, this will, um, <laughs> because we don't have the in-person lecture or the in-person labs right now, um, and when we do have in-person labs, you will still only be receiving half of the originally intended labs, if that makes sense, um, because your other half will be digital. So the format of a, this hybrid class will be a little bit different. Um, this lecture and learn series is probably going to be a little bit longer than an hour, and it's going to introduce assignments and topics that you will be working on in the lab, which is basically your virtual homework. <laughs> um, so in addition to that uh, virtual homework, um, you are expected to still capture the additional one or two hours of class time virtually, whether or not you consider that class time and you compartmentalize or um, it's just one big workload of a class. Uh, so if, if you are still confused or if things don't make sense, um, let me know. Otherwise, we will keep going. Um, another announcement is that the syllabus and the introductory meeting um, is posted on e-learning. Last Friday, we had an introductory meeting live um, and it was recorded. And what we did, the first half hour we reviewed um, 1490 design communication one and the second half hour we reviewed this class most of you are in both um, some students are only in 1490 so I did that first so they could leave um, I don't think there's any students in this class that aren't in 1490 um, but I, I have to everybody's still transferring and moving around so once everything settles I'll be able to really formally get a, a view of who's in which class. Um, but definitely watch that um, and ask some questions on the discussion board after this lecture. There will be a discussion board for the this you know week one, but then there will also be a syllabus discussion board. And I am giving five points extra credit for Anybody who asks a question from the syllabus or you know the course overall, um, so there will be um, it's first come first serve to the question. So um, only ask 
a question once, whether or not you ask it or someone else asks it. Uh, it is first come, first serve, um, but you can probably think of a different question if somebody's asked that. Um, so yeah, if you, if you want that opportunity, um, five points towards assignment one, which we'll go over at the end of this lecture. Um, and so look for that after the lecture on the discussion board. All right, the first topic on our doc is uh, the profession. So what, what is a profession anyway? A lot of the times we, we use the word profession um, I, you, you know, might call a college teacher a professor, uh, <laughs> um, and you may use the word career or job in lieu of profession. They all have a, a different meaning. So we call interior design a profession, um, and it could also be called a career, but the profession is the act of taking, <laughs> it's rooted in um, taking a vow, usually to a religious community, uh, but in contemporary society, it's also associated with um, a principal calling or employment. And so we are called a profession because interior design is considered a professional degree. What does that mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> So if you have a professional degree, it means that you have a terminal degree, which means you don't need a master's, you don't need a PhD to get to the highest point. Um, but it's really focused on professional practice as opposed to theoretical or philosophical um, studies. And so other examples of uh, professional degrees or professional practices would be architecture, um, engineering, uh, law, and medicine. So we're in good company. Um, <laughs> all of these professions have their own um, social and national groups. And in each group, they have created a, a code of ethics. So um, our in our code, and we'll be talking about this, we have to... Uh, take in health, safety, and welfare. It's very similar to architecture um, and uh, medicine. Uh, and so that's that's why we're called a profession because we are a community. We come around a set of agreed upon ethics and values. Um, it, if you don't, there are some people that don't wanna be associated with this community. It doesn't mean they're not a part of the profession. Um, it just means they're not a part of the community and they don't associate with that. Uh, there's not a, a lot of those, um, but it, do, it does happen. And in every country, there's um, a national community, there's international communities. Um, so it's really fun to get involved in that way. Um, this picture on the left is of Neocon. Um, Neocon is an annual event uh, held in the merchandise market in Chicago. It is the largest conference in the world. <laughs> and the merchandise market is a huge building. It has its own zip code <laughs> and its own postal workers. <laughs> um, so Neocon is the coming together of the interior design industry. And there's new furniture designers there. They're showcasing new work, new fabrics, new materials, new trends. Um, speakers. It's, it's really fun. It's really tiring. <laughs> Your feet will hurt, but I do recommend that you attend Neocon at some point um, throughout your uh, career at Western. And we do have uh, planned field trips to go to Neocon. Um, and so moving on. So we're studying interior design and design um, is a part of an environment. That's we're designing an environment, right? But what really are environments? I feel like a lot of people just associate the word environment with the natural environment. So when you call yourself an environmentalist, it's assumed that you're an activist for the natural environment. <laughs> um, 
which is which is correct that is the correct definition of that term but there's also the built environment which is the human made environment um, and that includes buildings sidewalks that even includes uh, natural elements like plants and trees that are uh, groomed and arranged in a planned way that this also includes street and telephone poles and our our sewer system and just traffic systems. Um, so there's a lot of different layers to the built environment. Um, but there's also this social environment. Sometimes it's visual and sometimes it's not, uh, but it does exist. And I'm sure that even though you're, say you're sitting in a large room, a, a, like a party, um, obviously you can see the physical environment. You can see the social environment and how people are interacting with one another. But there's also the social environment that is non-visual, um, that is influenced by the design and a lot of other factors. But it's it's a lot of um, social hierarchy and economics and class and these things that aren't always visual but do exist and are really important when we consider design. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so environments spaces places policy and all in between <laughs> um so on this uh diagram on the left you see nano which is like a cellular level and on the all the far right you see global um which you know is huge it's global it's the entire earth um and then there's a scale of spaces in between um and on the left uh well you can see i've divided this uh, scale into three sections. Um, and these are the three primary scales of design. So you have interior design, you have architecture, and you have like urban or policy. Um, and so interior design is very psychological. So we're, you know, we interact in smaller spaces. We're focused on how do you feel? What do you think? What is the texture you're feeling? What is the object you're holding? How does your body relate to your surroundings? Um, and a lot of that does uh, go into architecture and architecture does overlap into some of that. But architecture also deals with the building scale. Uh, which means architects have to look at buildings in relationship to other buildings <laughs> and in relationship to large spaces. So instead of just um, thinking about how you feel in the entrance of the space, an architect will also consider how that entrance of the space is interacting with the street level um, or you know the park nearby or other spaces within the building on a larger level. Um, not that interior designers don't get into that because they do. Um, and then you have urban design or policy. Um, and policy is a form of design and designers have a big role in changing policy. And honestly, the, the rules and codes and regulations that you'll learn about in this program um, they're, they're all very important for health, safety, and welfare, but at the same time, um, you will become a design expert and policymakers are not design experts. So they rely on you to push and challenge their view of the world and how, um, new regulations will happen or, um, new exceptions to those regulations will happen. Um, and they also look at you know, larger cities and how are they related to the region. They're looking at um, train networks and large circulation networks throughout uh, the world. Um, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a big difference from you know, the nanocellular level where we're thinking about um, our sensory experience in space. All of them are important and they all do really interact with each other, but I created this diagram to show you how they influence each other as well. So just because you may be really interested in textile design does not mean that you won't be interacting with policy or working on a global level because you will be sourcing your materials from all over the world, right? So it really, really matters. <laughs> 
Um, there are professional routes to interior design. Um, and so as a profession, of course, design and interior design has existed for many, many, many years since the dawn of humanity, really. Um, but as a organized civil profession in the United States <laughs> really started in the 70s. And in 1975, the Council for Interior Design Qualification and the National Council for Interior Design um, was created. And so I might mention NCIDQ, which is how we refer to the exams to become a certified interior designer. Um, and then the Council for Interior Design Qualification runs the NCIDQ and monitors the NCIDQ. Um, so it starts to create a baseline of qualifications to be in the profession. Um, and then also in 1975, the American Society of Interior Design was created. And this was the first, um, I, I want to say social club, but it, it's, it's way more than that. It's um, a social professional network of designers that would come together for networking. Um, and this is how things like Neocon come into play. And um, local chapters of groups and scholarships. And so this is a group of professionals supporting each other by um, coming together as a group because there's power in numbers, right? <laughs> so the industry, um, really the profession of what we do is based upon this community. Um, and then throughout the 80s and 90s, another um, social network was created called Unified Voice. And now when Unified Voice was created, it was because um, design in the 80s and 90s became much more commercial, commercially based. Uh, there was a huge economic boom. So there were new offices. Their office furniture is huge. If you've ever been in an office building and seen um, you know, the <laughs> cubicles, which we call workstations, those are all designed by interior designers. And they don't just um, get there like puzzle pieces. You have to go through and design each workstation custom. Uh, and you will have classes just on that. <laughs> so I won't go much further than that. But the unified voice was really trying to be a little bit more dedicated to the commercial side of the industry because the American Society of Interior Design or ASID uh, was a little bit more focused on residential. And so this is also the first time we started to begin to see a shift. I'm sure it's, pretty, it's a stereotype to ask people, oh, are you interested in residential or commercial? <laughs> um, that's what people ask because they don't know anything about the profession or interior design. Um, but it does have roots in that as well. Um, and then in 1994, Unified Voice uh, rebranded and called themselves the Commercial Interior Design Association, which they are known as today, IIDA. And IIDA is the organization that's associated with IDSO, which is the Interior Design Studio Organization that I mentioned um, at the beginning of this lecture. Um, and then as the profession grew and these groups were supporting and qualifications to become an interior designer were advancing, the interior design experience program began, which basically says to be eligible to take the tests to become a certified interior designer, you need to have acquired so many um, hours of work experience. So it's, it's sort of like an apprenticeship, um, but you have to have that to, to just be eligible to take the exam and to be eligible to uh, get hours that qualifies you for the exam, you do need to have an accredited university degree, um, which brings us to 2012, the International Design Continuing Education Council, IDEC. You'll hear us say IDEC all the time. That is its own social network organization dedicated for educators in design. So we have, you know, the residential group, we have the commercial group, and now we have the educators. They all work together and they all support each other and make sure that as a 
as a large design community, we're upholding the ethics and values of health, safety, and welfare and making positive change in the world. Um, but some things have happened since 2012. Um, so <laughs> up till today, we have what's called the Council for Interior Design Accreditation. And you will hear this a lot during your time at Western because we are currently going through this right now. It's called CETA. You'll hear us say CETA. Um, and so you're in a CETA program. What does that mean for you? You might not know too much about design to know that you do need an accredited university degree to be considered an interior designer. Um, and every seven years, um, those accredited institutions have to become re-accredited. There's an evaluation process um, to make sure that you know, we're graduating students that are living up to these standards. Um, and so I believe it's in about three years we will officially have our next review. Um, but we are supposed to be gathering student work and evidence. Um, and basically, our, we're documenting our program, giving it a good snapshot um, for the three years before our evaluation. We have an exhibition and um, people from all over the country come and evaluate us. They'll talk to you. They'll talk to us. <laughs> um, there are universities that are not accredited and those are okay too. It just means that you will learn a little bit of a different type of uh, content and you will not be eligible to become a certified interior designer. Um, but being at a CETA institution gives you um, a professional advantage. So the first thing it does is it gives you mobility in your career. So CETA has a global reach. Remember that scale of nano to global? Um, so CETA connects interior designers through that whole scale. And uh, Western or all you know accredited schools and institutions um, and CETA come together to really support that scale in um, helping CETA, um, you know, graduates <laughs> and registered or certified interior designers or st you know, students on their way to becoming certified, make sure that they have a professional network to rely on, um, which really helps with finding jobs across the country, across the world. Um, even though CETA is strictly for the US and Canada. Um, it is known throughout Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, so if you did, you know, decide you wanted to become um, an interior designer in China after you graduate, uh, your accredited degree will be, you know, highly thought of when you go there. Um, they know what the standards are and everything that we value and that is um, really impressive. Um, and so obviously with the CETA degree, you can become a professional, um, a licensed professional. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, you have to attend a, a CETA accredited school. You have to get a degree <laughs> and then you have to work on getting your hours. And to do that, uh, to get your um, official hours, you need to work under a licensed professional. So that might mean a certified interior designer or a licensed architect. Um, and then once you have those hours, you can take your exam, the NCIDQ exam, and become certified. And becoming certified means that you can go into any state um, and be an interior designer. Not every state requires certification to call yourself an interior designer, um, but you cannot advertise that you are an interior designer unless you are a certified professional, meaning you have passed the test. Without that, you can call yourself a designer or, um, an interior specialist or, you know, whatever title that you want to give yourself. Um, but you will not be an interior designer, um, or acknowledged in other parts of the country. Um, so 
but it also means that you meet excellent standards. So attending a CETA accredited program means that um, the program and the students are upheld to a really high set of standards, um, not just for maintaining the health, safety, and welfare and the values and ethics of the community, but also um, the talent and the ability and the knowledge. Um, all of that is evaluated. Um, so that, again, that evaluation will happen in the next three years. Um, so we've been talking about health, safety, and welfare quite a bit. I am going to play this video, um, and it is linked. So if you want to go through the slides as a PDF um, without the narration, you can do that as well. I'm going to post the PDF slides under lectures. Um, and then you can click on this and it will link you to this video as well. But I am going to play this short video of an interior designer talking about how she um, incorporates design and health, safety, and welfare. I'm an NCIDQ certified interior designer. The role is not just about creativity. There's a lot of technical coordination that has to happen. We're not just doing furniture and finishes, it's lighting design. The ADA requirements, the fire rating codes, it's the number of exits you have to have through a space. You know, making it a good experience for the humans that use the space. Architecture is a licensed profession. You need to have, you know, a certain amount of education and you need to pass the NCARB exam. Interior design is no different. We need to have that same certification also. When an interior designer is, is doing the planning, we're thinking about the design, the aesthetic, and the feel of how people move through the space. Also about the health of the people that are in the space. Very early on in the Cohen Hospital for Women and Newborns, we really got in depth with the durability, the cleanability, and the infection control of the materials that go into a room. We actually brought in the environmental services team to clean some of the rooms that we mocked up so they could like test the infection control. Flooring for a hospital is really one of their biggest investments, and it also can be a liability for slip and falls. So we have to make sure all the flooring meets all the ADA slip resistant requirements. If there's wood paneling on a wall, the wood has to be fire rated if it's in an exit corridor. It's really important for the interior designer to pay attention to the materials and things that are going into those exit corridors, which would have a different fire rating than maybe what might be happening in an exam room. Before we even started doing any design, our team came up with a questionnaire and we did phone interviews with new moms. We wanted to kind of gather information, it was like, what was your experience like when you were in the hospital? Like, what do you remember? How can we make it more comfortable for these new moms? All the feedback that we heard affected how we designed eight months later. If I was not a certified interior designer, I think it would be difficult to design an interior without understanding those technical components that are critical for the public health, safety, and welfare within an interior space. Yeah, so, so that was really cool. Very simple, very short explanation, but it, um, it really impresses the importance of what we do and the amount of considerations that interior designers need to make in the environment. So focusing back on the health, safety, and welfare and this diagram of spaces, places, policy, and all in between, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, known as the EPA, um, has done studies, and on those studies they found that Americans, on average, spend approximately 90% of their time indoors. So on this scale <laughs> of all of these spaces, the area that I have outlined in red is where people are spending 90% of their time. Now think about that in relationship to when this uh, diagram was divided into three sections. Where does that 90% of the time 
fall in those three sections. It falls in interior design. Um, so <laughs> that's really important. 90% uh, of the health, safety, and welfare of a person needs to be coming from indoors. Um, <laughs> so think about that um, while you're designing and know that interior design has some really significant responsibilities. So as we mentioned, the NCI DQ exams, um, they have a definition of interior design. And again, this is rooted in all of these social networks that have come together to define the profession. There, because there's there would be a lot of definitions of interior design, but a identified definition um, needed to be created, and it is interior design is a multifaceted profession in which creative and technical solutions are applied within a structure to achieve a built interior environment. These solutions are functional, enhance the quality of life and culture of the occupants, and are aesthetically attractive. Designs are created in response to and coordinated with the building shell and acknowledge the physical location and social context of the project. Designs must adhere to code and regulatory requirements and encourage the principles of environmental responsibility. The interior design process follows a systematic and coordinated methodology, including research, analysis, and integration of knowledge in the creative process, whereby the needs and resources of the client are satisfied to produce an interior space that fulfills the project goals. That is quite the definition. <laughs> um, and so throughout this course, we are going to be dissecting this definition word for word, sentence by sentence. What does it really mean? What is some background information into what they're saying and why they're saying this? So going back to health, safety, and welfare, here is a table of specifications of things that interior designers need to consider when assuring that an environment is healthy and safe and that human welfare is first priority in a space. Um, and on this uh, table of specifications, I have written in different colors, so they stand out, examples, just minor um, relatable examples of how these things impact health, safety, and welfare. So for instance, human behavior, um, next to it, it says psychological and sociological. As we mentioned before, um, there's this social environment that's non-visual um, and it's very psychological. So environments have the potential to cause depression, anxiety, and isolation. We need to consider that when we're designing. And there's a lot of research uh, out there into what causes um, different mental health conditions in a space. Um, and then there's human factors. So there's ergonomics. So ergonomics, that is how your body feels and fits in a space. Um, so think about the chair you're sitting in right now. Does it feel like it was designed for your body? Um, or does it feel maybe a little bit too uh, universal? Um, the evaluation of your body in that chair is the study of ergonomics. And it's a really important science in product and furniture design, as you could imagine. But an example of how this could impact you is it could it could give you back pain. And that's that's a you know a generous <laughs> how it could affect you. It can it can have some pretty uh, steep consequences. Um, and again, we have we have barrier free design um, and accessibility. So you know, are people's and people in wheelchairs, um, deaf people, blind people, are they able to get around? Because um, if there's barriers, they can't get around the space. And so, a it 
prevents them from using space. And B, this is something that can also go back to the human behavior and cause depression and anxiety um, because maybe the wheelchair ramp is at the back of the building and people in wheelchairs don't get that experience of coming into the space and feeling that wow factor. Um, so that, that has a lot of psychological impacts and physical impacts. Um, and then there's universal design, which is very similar to accessibility. Um, and it kind of broadens the category to make spaces universal for all. So we've heard of custom design, where we design something for a specific person. Universal design is the opposite. <laughs> it's meant to accommodate all people. So it's, it's a very contentious topic. Some people swear by universal design and other people say, if you design for all, you really design for none um, because it's really not helping any specific demographic of people if it's just you know m meant to be for everybody. Um, you can oversee or lack specific qualities that some people need. Um, but an example of this, um, would be social safety or accommodating for all ages. Um, so for example, um, people of different ages see colors and lights differently. Um, they use a building differently. So understanding how um, different age demographics or um, identities, socially based identities, um, can make you feel safe or is the building, are you not going to go in there because it just doesn't feel like it's meant for you? I'm sure we've all been in spaces where like, yeah, I'm not meant to be here. <laughs> um, but there's no sign saying you can't be here and it's a public space, but you still don't feel comfortable there. Most likely it's because um, it's missing some universal design elements that relate to you. Um, and this, this isn't just like a wheelchair ramp. I guess it could be um, a ramp or a method of mobility for, say, a large family. So you have multiple people. Multiple people don't necessarily fit on a narrow sidewalk. And um, you can't easily carry a wheelchair up and down stairs. <laughs> um, it's not very accessible or universal. I mean, you can do it. But it makes you feel like you weren't supposed to be there with a, with a, a baby. <laughs> um, and you will experience this in a lot of um, buildings from the 50s and 60s and even in the 70s. Um, because at that time, um, women and a lot of people of color just were not um, considered in the design of commercial spaces. A lot of those spaces now are being retrofitted to be more welcoming, but they do exist. You will come across um, old buildings that don't have an elevator and um, there's no way up to the top floor if you're in a wheelchair. That does happen. Um, and, and we'll talk about when it does happen, um, what happens, what are the next steps? What if you're in a wheelchair and you're like, I need to get to floor seven and there's no elevator? How I have a class up there. <laughs> How am I supposed to get there? <laughs> um, we will talk about that later on. Um, but there's also fire and life safety. So people can become trapped um, or they can fall and get trampled. Or if they can't hear um, an alarm or if there's not a proper exit um, sign or alarm, they might not even know of the danger because they're in a closed room and um, they're not near, uh, there's not an alarm close enough to them where they could hear it. Um, and so there are a lot of codes related to that. Um, circulation is really important. And when we say circulation, um, we're talking about how people get through space. So vertical circulation, that's, um, the idea of the elevator or the stairs. How do people get up and down? Signage is how the circulation is working with your eyes. So you know to go this way, then that way, then this way. Um, signage can happen in an assortment of ways in a space. And then wayfinding is the use of environmental psychology to guide people through a space. And so sometimes that's just the subtle use of lighting because people will naturally follow a lit path. Um, but if those are not planned or designed well, it, it can cause neurological conditions. Um, 
materials. We all know that there's materials that are just toxic. <laughs> there's, you know, artificial materials. There's really dangerous materials. And um, those materials off gas into the air. So um, say you have a paint and you put it on your wall and then you're noticing that it's kind of turning colors or in some areas it's bubbling or there's like a drip. It's because A, the adhesive is toxic and B, the, the paint, if it has a smell, um, if it makes your air quality worse, um, it's off-gassing toxins into your air quality, um, which is really bad for your breathing, but also those toxins just get into your body and they can cause things like cancer. Um, and then there's lighting. So a lack of contrast can result in physical injury um, or they can cause further eye problems. Um, and then acoustics, you know, it can cause headaches. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain how um, bad acoustic design can harm you. Um, and then there's indoor air quality. Um, and so this is a little bit different than the materials and off-gassing. Materials and off-gassing contribute to indoor air quality, um, but indoor air quality stands on its own. And we'll also, we'll often refer to this as IAQ, which stands for indoor air quality. Um, there's a lot of things that can contribute. So you'll have poor indoor air quality if you seal up your building and turn the air conditioning on and never let natural air in. Um, not that that is going to you know, poison you or be really bad, but natural air will clean out toxins um, as opposed to just recycle them. Um, and so things like air conditioning contributes towards indoor air quality and, and it can cause asthma. Um, so also, you know, ductwork of air conditioning um, or forced heat, it could get really dirty in there. There's filters. Um, there are companies that specialize in the cleaning of vents and ducts and the mechanical system. Um, because if you don't clean those, you're going to be getting a lot of dust and debris and toxins coming out in your air. And that is really what does cause asthma. Um, I used to, when I was um, 18, <laughs> I worked at a retail store in the mall and um, a lot of the employees at our store started coughing and just feeling not great when we worked, but nobody really noticed until um, I went to the doctor and I had never had breathing problems in the past. And uh, he asked me what my work environment was like. And I told him, I was like, I work at the mall. <laughs> he said, that's the worst place you can work <laughs> for indoor air quality because the mechanical system is so large that it's almost impossible to properly clean it. And each store is um, responsible for cleaning their own vents and filters and ductwork. And I went you know, back to the manager and I asked, when was the last time our mechanical areas were cleaned? And they were like, I don't think ever. <laughs> um, and so, we hired somebody to come in and clean and it was really disgusting and nasty but once that happened people did start feeling a little bit better um and so that definitely think about your breathing problems in different spaces um yeah and so obviously there's way more examples that that was just a brief overview um and so that concludes the profession section. Um, you know, we're in this for the health, safety, and welfare. There's a lot of professional communities coming together and supporting each other um, to make sure that design is safe and functional. Um, because obviously we care about the sensory experience in the aesthetics, um, but really those are secondary to, is the space going to kill me or not? <laughs> um, and so the next topic that we're going to talk about is practice. So in practice, say you take on a project. Somebody's hired you to design their home. Um, you have to go through a design process. We will um, have assignments and classes devoted to the design process, like all of your studio classes. Um, 
but I am going to briefly go through each stage in the design process. Um, there's six. Um, so the first stage is essentially programming. We call this pre-design. So it's everything you do before you begin design. So, I mean, you need to understand the space. What do the clients want? Do you have a concept? Do you have a design statement? Do you have goals? Um, and then you need to do some research. Who are my clients? What do they care about? Um, what are their health concerns? You know, what are their ages? Are they gonna age in place? Do they have special needs? Um, am I interested in using certain materials that I need to research prior to implementing them in a design? Um, and then what spaces do I even need to include in a design? So that is actually called the program. It's a list of the spaces. So you would, you know, living room, dining room, entrance, <laughs> bathroom, kitchen. Those are really basic ones. But you would, you would list all of the rooms that um, they would like. And a lot of the time, um, clients don't particularly know the full extent of their program. And so as an interior designer, programming is really important um, because it you bring your expertise to the table and you answer questions and problems um, for the client that they had, but they didn't even realize they had. Um, and so that's a really great value to have. And then once we have all of the pre-design um, completed, we get into concept development. So say you've you know, you've got everything for this client's house planned out. You know the spaces, you know the size of those spaces, you know who these people are, you know what they like, um, you know what materials you would like to incorporate. Um, but what about the concept? What are the goal isn't just the health, safety, and welfare. That's that's baseline, that's expected. Um, from there, we need to create a larger concept. Um, so maybe this family wants the design of their home to um, make them feel more connected and bring them together. So how now you need to really research and think, how can I use design to make people feel connected? And this is where environmental psychology comes in. We will talk about environmental psychology later in this lecture. Um, but this is where you will research those and you'll create a statement. Um, and it's not just the project goals, but it's the concept statement. Um, and then there are specific design principles and elements that you will use to achieve that concept. Um, so your design achieves the concept. But then you'll start drawing. Um, you start doing schematics. Um, so we call it schematic design. Um, you know, if you think of a scheme as like a an organization of something or a plan. Um, so schematic design is anything from the bubble diagramming. So you draw circles of those spaces and you just kind of um, start to plan them out um, to the actual drawing and where you're putting furniture and how things are really working in the, um, in the design. The concept development obviously is a larger stage than the pre-design. Um, then you have stage or phase three, which is the presentation. Um, and so as designers, we not only need to research, understand the concept, understand what um, the clients need and how the space can achieve that, but we have to communicate all of these things um, to the world or to our clients or to our teachers. How do we take what's in our mind and communicate that visually, verbally? Um, it's, this is a really challenging part of design. Making something appear from your mind is incredibly challenging. Um, and so we will learn about how to do conceptual drawings and scaled floor plans and mood boards and all of the different visual elements that help people understand your ideas. Um, there are rendering techniques. Um, and then there are more uh, data-driven visuals um, where you can 
show your research and if you get into budget, if you need to get into schedules, there's ways to visualize those as well without, you know, just a list. Um, and then phase four is the final design development and documentation. So the client loves your communication and your visual, visual presentation. They're all for it. Um, so now you need to develop working drawings and working drawings means that you start to create your design in a way that a builder can read it and recreate it or um, a consultant can read it. So if you want a light fixture somewhere, you need to think about where that light fixture is and where the switch for it will be. Um, and then create a drawing just for that to give to an electrician. Um, and so all the trades need that. <laughs> you can think about the duct work again and um, think about the living room. Okay, so where is the couch going to be? Where is the family going to be located in the space? So where is the best place to think about where you want the heat or the cool air to come from? Do you want it coming directly onto their bodies? Do you want it dispersed? What height? Um, there's a lot of considerations. Again, there are classes dedicated to those types of considerations, um, but this is the type of documentation that you need to create. A schedule. So a schedule is not only you know a calendar of dates and times, but in design we uh, call a schedule a list of items in the design with their specifications. Um, and so say you created a lighting schedule. So you'll take that light fixture that you were just thinking about and um, you'll put it in a spreadsheet. You'll label it on the drawing. You'll say this is one, <laughs> just call it one, put a one on it. And then on um, you know, a spreadsheet, not on the drawing, but on a spreadsheet, you'll have one and then you'll name the light fixture. So it'll be like arc lamp <laughs> or you know something like that um and then you'll when you research that type of light fixture you'll come across a spec sheet and that will tell you more information about it that'll tell you the type of voltage or wattage or bulb or shade or environmental conditions required for this light you will document all of those on this schedule and this helps so when the electrician is going through and implementing your design in the space, um, they will have your schedule and they'll say, okay, I know this light fixture needs to go there. This one needs to go there. Oh, you're going to share a switch. Um, this is how they're working, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so all trades will take your schedules and walk through the space. And it's a written checklist essentially for them to make sure that they can accurately and successfully implement your design in the space because it is it can be really hard to communicate um, with people of a different discipline or a different trade um, and miscommunication happens all the time um, and this is where design errors occur or you know, say you wanted this type of finish on something and you didn't document it in the schedule so the contractor the builder was like okay i know they want this light fixture but it has two different colors they didn't say it so i'm just going to pick the cheapest one a lot of the time that's what happens. Um, so you really need to think holistically, um, but also very specifically <laughs> about everything. And then there's execution. So this is the actual time that everything's being built. Um, and so there, you'll, you'll hear people say, I need to do a walkthrough. Um, and so to ensure the health, safety and welfare, um, a certified interior designer would go to a space, probably with the architect and the builder, and walk through and make sure everything is up to code, up to standards, um, because we are liable uh, for our design. So if there is a problem, um, say we put a we designed the chandelier to be over the t uh, over a big bathtub, um, but there are minimum distances that lighting can be from a tub full of water <laughs> um and and you know the builder doesn't always know that it's up to us when we design it and we specify those things to tell them sometimes they do you know a really experienced builder will know these things and they'll ask you um, but not all the time and so if that chandelier gets built and if it <laughs> 
falls into the tub or if so, you know something god forbid happens and a problem occurs or somebody gets hurt that is the um person who signed off that's the designer um liable for those issues so you know if it's the wrong paint color that's more of a financial change if it's somebody is injured or hurt um then there's there's some serious um you can lose your certification there can be legal action taken against you it is it is a little scary but um once you start doing it enough um, and you work collaboratively with the builder, with the architect, with the electrician, with all of the different tradespeople, and you tell them your intentions, they will help you. So if I you know, told the electrician, like, I really like this light, and I want the effect of somebody in the bathtub um, really enjoying this dim light as they bathe. Um, but I'm really concerned um, if this gets wet, what happens? The electrician will be like, oh, you know, I've... I've dealt with this before. Here's some options, some things to think about. And the, together you can come up with um, a way to implement it or execute it while also achieving your design concept and your idea. Um, so that that's really cool. Working with other disciplines is really fun. Um, and then there's the evaluation, which is after everything's been built, Obviously, you're going to go through and you're going to make sure um, that it looks great, that it's working, that everybody's happy. But then you may go back in a year and interview your clients and say, what's working? What's not? Um, how did I do? You know, how is the space performing? Is anything broken? Is, you know, paint chipping? Is there any serious problems happening? Is, you know, the tile under this big bathtub starting to crush? <laughs> um, Things like that, because oftentimes that's included in your contract. Um, and so the clients are able to um, know that those things will be taken into consideration. And they it's not just the projects one and done. Um, they're in communication with you. You're still a team. Um, it's really great to have good relationships with your clients because this is how new jobs come in. Um, and so that, that is a quick <laughs> overview of the design process. So in your future classes where you have formal design studios and you'll get a design project, um, you will spend the whole semester going through, um, you know, phase one through three or four. Obviously, we're not going to do the evaluation um, or build. I mean, maybe if you want to build it, but you won't be required to build build. Um, a building. <laughs> um, but you'll, you may in some classes need to provide the specifications or the schedules or the um, working drawings. Um, in addition to the presentation drawings that have the renderings and your mood board and your concept, um, a variety of that or some classes focus on one or the other. Um, and in our class, we're going to touch on a little bit of those. But one thing I really um, want to take some time to pull out of the design process is programming. Um, and so programming, as I mentioned before, it's, it's where your value of an interior designer really comes into play. Um, and so understanding your client. I am just going to use an example of a project I've done before. These are screenshots of a project I've done. So this image right here, um, obviously it's a pretty visual. Um, so this was for a co-working space that also had um, apartments above it. So you had the people that are using the building, you have your co-workers, you know, the people that have desks in the co-working space. You have travelers um, because you have people that maybe only come in for the day and they get a desk or they're temporary or they're, they have temporary housing there. Um, you have management and you know, the people that run the building. Um, and you have residents, the people that live there. Um, and then you have what we called for this project was butterflies, <laughs> um, which are people that come to the space to see their friends or to, for an event or an amenity. So say this space has a movie theater in it. So 
in this instance, a butterfly would be somebody that, you know, isn't, is not a resident or a coworker, but comes, um, because maybe their friend is and they're going to watch a movie. And so understanding all of the people that are going to be using this space and then thinking about when do they use the space? Um, so co-working spaces are usually 24 seven. Everybody has a different job and different times. And so you should be able to come in and use your desk when you want. Um, but if that space has amenities like a movie theater, that movie theater might have specific hours of operation. Um, therefore, if you have a butterfly coming in for the movie, they're going to they're gonna be at the space during that time frame versus in the middle of the night when they're working um, or when the residents are sleeping. So understanding the time frames that different spaces are used um, helps you plan the floor plan and how those spaces are arranged, um, but it also helps you understand what your client really needs. So when you're not working with a single client, like in a, you're designing the house for a family, you're actually like your client is a developer, <laughs> um, but you're designing for other people. So you're designing apartments for what will eventually be residents. So you want to think about them when you design, even though your client is management or the developer. Um, and so you, you have to look at it from all different angles. Sometimes storytelling is a way to um, get your mind doing this. So you you might get like create a few characters <laughs> and say, oh, you know, like Jessica, she lives here. She also works downstairs. So at 8 a.m. she gets up, she goes downstairs. Um, she wants coffee. So we'll have a little coffee bar, but it's gonna be outside and you know, so you take her through the day and you think about everything that she will encounter and try to predict any challenges or obstacles in the space. Um, so say her desk actually is on the far west side of the building and she primarily works in the morning. Um, so you need to think about how she's going to get the lighting that she needs because um, the sun rises in the east and so desks along the east side are going to get a lot of that natural daylight um, and they won't need as much artificial light um, which we always try to minimize if possible but her desk might you need to make sure she can still get that natural light how is she getting it through maybe it's skylights maybe you know transom windows throughout the space Maybe it's a way of reflecting the light. Um, so that's a way of predicting an issue that might occur. Or maybe it's just saying, okay, I need to rethink the placement of these desks because this isn't gonna work. Then there's the list of these spaces. Um, this isn't the schedule. It looks like a schedule, but it's actually the program. Um, so on the left hand side is a list of some spaces in this uh, building. And I know this is small, probably on the recording, but on the PDFs, you can zoom in and, and look at things. Um, then you have the description. Um, so in this, uh, let's see, we have a resource area. I've just picked one out from the list. So the description, um, it's a small library. Uh, and what does that, you know, obviously we need, we'll say we need one of those. We only need one for the space, but you might need, like if there's an entrance, you might need multiple entrances. And then in each column, you'll see along the top are different um, criteria. So there's square footage, um, there's occupancy, which is how many people are gonna fit in that space. Um, so if you have a restroom, a single stall restroom, the occupancy would be one or one family. Um, Technically, the size of it could accommodate more people, but you want to think realistically, too, of like what's actually going to happen in this situation. Um, you might have a bathroom that uh, or your office space might have 50 people working in it. So how many toilets do you need? Things like this you have to consider. Views in, views out. Um, sometimes you're doing things you don't want people to see from the street or from another building, or sometimes you have a great view 
and you want to frame that from the, you want your living room to like look out into a great view. Um, or maybe you want your desk to be able to see the street. Um, and then there's public and private. Um, so for instance, the co-working space is a little bit more of a public space. People can come in, even though they're, they don't have a desk there, they can hang out, they can see things. Um, there are some spaces like that library resource room might be a little bit more private because that's really serving just the coworkers. Um, but then there's more of the private spaces like the apartments above it. And then the adjacency. So that's, you know, what's adjacent? Um, what spaces need to be by each other? So maybe if there's a kitchen space, does it need to be adjacent to a bathroom? Does it need to be adjacent to the recreational area? Um, that's up to you as a designer. And your client may tell you some of these things, but um, most of the things, they it won't occur to them. And so you really need to investigate and determine what are the best adjacencies? How are the butterflies entering the space? How do they enter differently than the coworkers? And what spaces are they using? So the entrance for the butterflies doesn't need um, to be near the resource room, but maybe the private entrance for the coworkers is by the mail room in the resource room. Um, so now you know what those entrances need to be, be by. So the butterfly entrance has more amenities to buy it. The coffee bar, the movie theater, um, maybe, you know, a hangout area um, versus the more areas that are just meant for the people that have a reserved desk in the space. Um, but you can also think about acoustics. Again, the list at the top is just the criteria that was used on this project. Every project's different and has different priorities. So you'll want to identify what those criteria are um, and then start to evaluate each space based upon those. So taking the program to the next step, um, you can see this is called the active spatial system. So essentially, this is circulation in the building. So we've taken, we've considered public and private, we've considered adjacencies, um, which is how, how these spaces are arranged, um, is the size of their bubble is proportional to the size that they are in real life. Um, so for instance, this open urban space is like four times as big as the community garden. Um, and so on the plan or on your diagram you're drawing that bubble is going to be about four times as big as the bubble for the community garden um but they'll want to be by each other so that's why they're by each other and they're overlapping even um and so you'll lay out all of those spaces um but you'll also try to include a way to communicate public and private spaces whether or not that literally means the front door is public and the back is private or a mixture um, and then you'll want to connect the spaces somehow. So not just adjacency, what they're next to, but um, where are they going? So let's go back to the example of the butterflies going to the movie and seeing their friends. Um, so let's find where they would enter. So, oh, here's a lounge, flexible open space, the kitchen. Um outdoor terrace, fitness space, cafe. So obviously they're going to be interacting with the area on the left that's in green. Oh, there's the cinema and the game room. Um, and so they're going to be maybe that dark dotted line. So primarily they're going to be using those spaces. They might be outside at a picnic table with their friends, um, but they need to go inside the cafe to get more coffee. Um, and so you have to think about the path that they'll take to get there. Um, what are they going to interact with? What are some other uh, circulation paths they're going to cross? Um, so thinking about multiple layers of circulation of people using space, again, going back to the mall, um, when you're at the mall, you see shoppers. But if you've ever worked at a mall, you know that there's also employees and workers and they use the space differently. Um, they might have a different time of day where they're using the space. Um, they might have spaces you don't see that they're walking. <laughs> um, maintenance may have access to the entire mall 
but not using the main corridors. So that's this is layers of circulation for different types of um, you know demographic of people. You have the shoppers, um, you have maintenance, you have the actual retail workers. Maybe you have um, food delivery. It's all coming in different channels. Um, so thinking about that in terms of this co-working example on this page, what are the different channels that are being used here? So management, they have offices. You have, you have people working, you might have some people cleaning, uh, maintaining the space. You might have guests coming in. You might have people coming in for lunch. You have the people working there the residents, there's a lot of different uses. And again, this is where storytelling comes into play to think about what is what is the space that Jessica is going to interact with. Um, so there's this is obviously supposed to be a pretty representation. Um, not you might not have to create, um, you know, a beautiful looking visual, but you do still need to think things through. So this could be a scribble on a piece of paper that's meant only for you or only for your colleague to talk about. Um, there's, you know, you don't always need to make things super pretty. Um, thinking about that same arrangement of spaces, so you can see the bubbles are the same. The bubbles didn't change. Um, but what changed was now they have straight lines to and from each other. Um, now we've separated the groups. So we have public, which is pretty much all the outdoor spaces and the amenities. Then you have co-working, which is in purple. Then you have the co-living, which are the apartments. Um, and then you have management in yellow. And then the pink are the butterflies. So you can notice that the butterflies don't have um, spaces designed just for them. They use the spaces designed for other people. So you're going to see them in dashed lines using the public spaces. Um, you're going to see co-living in dash lines using the private spaces. Um, so, and then there's different widths of these lines. Some of them are big, thick ones, and some of them you can barely see. Um, and what that means, um, so for co-living, for example, we'll say um, on the far right, you see it says one bedroom retreats. <laughs> so in a co-living space, you basically have a bedroom and you share the kitchen and the living room. So if you're in your bedroom and you want to go to the living room, that's pretty important. You should have, you know, fairly adjacent and easy access to the living room and the kitchen. Um, potentially, you know, an interfaith space or a meditation space um, and the library. But the library doesn't in this scenario, it doesn't need to be by the living area. <laughs> so how do you connect the bedrooms to both the living area and the library, but the library and living area don't need to be connected? Um, I know it sounds really confusing <laughs> and it's a challenge. Um, there's a million different ways this could get laid out. Um, so you have to think about, there's layers. So what are the other spaces? What do they need to touch? Um, this was the final diagram for this, but there were many, many iterations of how this could play out. And then you have, um, you're thinking about the exterior and interior relationship. So if we're going back to that scale of spaces, places, and everything in between, um, the, you know, the interior design area overlapped with architecture. Um, and the architecture overlapped with urban. So we are overlapping with architecture. Um, how are we, the interior designers, kind of starting to interact with the architectural areas outside? Um, and so thinking about that relationship is really critical. We do need to think about the ex outside because we're thinking about windows, we're thinking about sunlight, we're thinking about access. Where's the parking? Um, where are people coming in from? Where's the front door of the space? Um, so you, what we've done here is we've taken those spaces, we've isolated them into little pods. <laughs> um, so for instance, on the left with that open urban space, um, we have 
arrows indicating the direction where people would be coming from. So the open urban space may be the front facing of the building. And so people are coming at it, you know, from both directions. Um, but there might be a side entrance just to the cafe. Um, and obviously there's a back entrance to the cafe. So if you're a worker or you're delivering food, you're going to come in, you're going to stock the cafe, but then there's the community garden. You might need access to that community garden but you're not necessarily the client or the person using it. Um, and so that's what those arrows represent is the circulation paths, but specifically how they interact with the outside. So we're thinking about where their um, access points are, where are the doors? I wanna say entrances, but um, entrance implies a certain thing and that's not always the case. So. Uh, areas of access. And so here's the next stage of programming. This is this is no longer examples from my own work. Um, these are student works, um, just to show examples. Um, in programming, you've you've thought about the size of the bubble, the size of the space, the adjacency, the circulation, those access points. Um, but now you're, you're starting to really think about the layout. Are there focal points? So if I have an access and we'll say, we'll look at this bubble diagram on the left, I'm coming in this gallery space. What am I looking at? I'm gonna be, I wanna look right into the studio. I wanna see the path that goes outside and goes into the studio when I walk in. Um, and so that starts to shape where the spaces are. You're starting to slowly formulate a floor plan, so to speak. Um, and then on the right, you can see that they've done programming diagrams in their own way, um, listed the spaces, the relationships. There's so many different ways to do program diagrams. But then they started applying those bubbles um, based on their adjacencies and their needs, their access points. And you can see they started to draw an outline based on the bubbles. Um, so this is, this is a really interesting way that architecture and interior design come together. And it's really great to collaborate on larger spaces um, because the architects are thinking of, you know, the urban scale as well. Um, and so you can pull from that expertise and they can pull from your interior expertise and really decide the best location for certain spaces. So for instance, I once um, worked on a project in an urban area on an elementary school. Um, so it's an urban area. We just had a square block. Where are we going to put the playground? Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're thinking about, obviously we don't want kids running into the street. <laughs> um, and we, you know, we want playground, we want it to be touching or, you know, access through the gym or the cafeteria, but that's the interior designers thinking what the architects would be considering too, is the fact that they're, is a bus station across the street and there's an tall apartment building above it. And so if you're in that apartment building and you're looking down, you could have a direct line of sight into that playground. And maybe that's not what you want. Or maybe you don't want the kindergarten playground to be visible from the bus station. Um, so thinking about things like that, you can really, um, collaborate on. It's, it's really interesting. And as an interior designer, you can think about the urban scale. Nothing is stopping you. Um, but not all interior designers want to. They want to focus on um, the experience and rely on collaboration with other disciplines to provide their expertise. And these program diagrams, so this is, this is a project of a senior student, um, kind of, you know, a whip or a work in process, not a whip. <laughs> um, so on the left, this student was given um, a floor plate, the shape of the building. Um, and obviously the building has structure. So that grid right there is actually a column grid. Wherever you see lines interacting, that's where they're gonna have a column. And it's really easy to not consider that part um, but sometimes we do need to consider, uh, you know, columns and other structural elements that we just can't get around. Um, once you start learning more about structures and physics, 
you can start to say, oh, I really want this space here with this column. How can we, how can we avoid getting the column here? How can we um, make it so it's structurally sound without this column? And you say, oh, you know, I, I could really use a beam over here and, and I could do this with a truss. Um, so once you start knowing those things, you will have more design power. Um, but if you don't have that knowledge, it's, it's really hard to um, have that power over the space, which is what all of us really want. Um, and so after drawing that column grid, um, this student uh, began to uh, lay out their spaces. And so we have back of house, we have men. So this is for like a department store. So they're laying out these two um, images in the middle are the same, but they've rearranged the spaces. I know it looks similar, but if you look, they're experimenting with different arrangements of spaces. Um, if you were to look at their program diagram, their program diagram doesn't change. There's just many ways of um, laying out the program in space. And so you will go through weeks of iterations of this. Um, and then the next step is a block plan. So you know where the spaces are going to be. Um, now you got to think about the actual square footage. You're, you're slowly starting to firm up the space. They're not just loose bubbles anymore. Now we're, we're thinking about walls. We're thinking about access in a, a more specific concrete area. Um, so that's really, um, what programming is all about. It's, it's really important. It's a really important part of the design. And if you can imagine, it's all pre-designed. <laughs> so when I talked about the stages of the design process and I said the concept design is by far the largest, it is. So we just went through all of that programming information and we're still just the tip of the iceberg. We haven't really gotten into like the conceptual design. These diagrams on this page start to merge program with actual design. Um, but at some point, you're going to take this final drawing on the right, and you're going to actually start to draw walls with thicknesses and doors and windows and really think about, um, oh, I want this space needs to have a raised ceiling because I want this lighting fixture. Um, or I know I want floor to ceiling windows here. Um, so then you start to like shape the volume of the space as well, not just think about it flat. So another part of the practice is sustainability and accessibility. We mentioned accessibility earlier on in this lecture um, and sustainability. Everybody, you know, just like when you think of environment, you think of the natural environment or an environmentalist. But when you think of sustainability, you kind of also think about the natural environment. You think of eco-friendly <laughs> or green design. And that's only a part of it. So sustainability has three primary parts. There are, and I call them the three Ps. So there's people, planet, and profit. So to be um, really sustainable, and when I say really, I mean literally sustainable, to actually be sustainable, um, you need to serve the people, um, the planet, which is the environmentally friendly part, and the profit, which means um, it's economically healthy. Um, and down here it says sustainability is the connector of any enterprise's bottom line initiatives. You're going to hear that word a lot, bottom line. Um, that's, that's the bottom line of like, we're cutting the cost here, the, our bottom line is this. Okay, like we need to achieve it, but this is the bottom line. Um, so large corporations have, you know, these large mission statements and vision statements and integrity statements and sustainability statements. <laughs> um, so they're gonna, the companies usually use sustainability um, and talking about their bottom line initiatives. But what does that have to do with interior design? How does this like corporate speak um, relate to interior design is obviously we we want to be sustainable we want to incorporate sustainability so here's 
um, an example of how sustainability can apply to interior design. I have taken a screenshot from a website called the Living Building Challenge. And the Living Building Challenge outlines how design can be sustainable. Um, and thinking not only about the earth, but also people and profit. So with people, um, you want to make functional spaces, beautiful spaces. You want to think about their mental health or physical health. You want to think about their identity and the culture. Like what are, what are some important colors or motifs or shapes? Where, where is this design located and what's important to the community that you're designing for? Um, if you don't achieve that, then you don't, you don't, um, achieve the planet or the profit because you might do the building, but if people don't love it, if they don't use it, then actually it's not great for the environment because <laughs> you designed a building nobody's using. Um, so just always making sure that you are keeping people first in mind. Um, and then there's the planet. So we as interior designers source materials. Uh, we, we have, so much power in deciding what materials go where. And I'm not talking about pillows and blankets. I'm talking about large scale materials. <laughs> um, so are you sourcing marble slabs from Bolivia that need to come in through uh, a shipping crate on a, a, <laughs> a boat <laughs> um, and then go on a truck and come all the way to Michigan? Or are you thinking, hey, you know, we're, we're pretty close to Canada and they have some really great, um, wood sources. So I'm going to, I'm going to look at what resources are around us and what materials come from those. So there's less transportation of those materials and they're local. So they're, um, they're more contextually relevant. Um, and so people, you know, generally have, uh, an appreciation for materials that they are used to. Um, and so, but also, you know, things like, um, natural materials aren't always the best in the example of the marble coming from Bolivia or even bamboo coming from Asia. You know, we think of bamboo as this great sustainable material and it, and it is, um, because it's renewable, but it's not negative. <laughs> um, and so for us, it's not always the best. Um, and you're going to have a whole materials course and you're going to be sourcing materials for your projects and you're going to be researching them and learning all about them. Um, and so we'll move on to profit. And so how, how do I, as the interior designer, ensure that my project is contributing towards economic health? <laughs> how, like what, <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Well, if you are thinking about energy efficiency, that saves money. Um, so going back to the client where the family wants you to design their house, um, they, they are struggling to pay their monthly bills. And so you can uh, use your expertise to hone in on how you can help to alleviate those. So maybe they're losing a lot of their heating in the winter time um, because of the types of windows or you know there's a host of reasons or maybe they're they're gaining too much heat in the summer because they have just direct sunlight coming down on them um thinking about how can you just with some simple design solutions uh lower the cost of you know they won't have to turn on the air conditioning as much or they won't have to turn on the heat as much um you can maximize the daylight uh you can also use Energy Star appliances, and we're going to learn a lot more about economy and sustainability because that is that's a really important topic, um, and it is understandable. You know how do our understanding of how we fit into the economy um, through our designs and how our designs fit into the economy is also really important. And that's one of those things that connects the cellular level, the, that nano to the global. If you want to go to the website and read more about the Living Building Challenge, um, you can click on this green link in the upper right-hand corner 
um, in the PDF and it will take you to their website. They also review more than just design considerations. Um, I've only you know t discussed sustainable design considerations, but they have a lot more if you're interested. So kind of moving past sustainability, we still have our people, planet, and profit. But as I mentioned before, unless you're designing for the people and you're making people happy and feel good and your space is functional, you're not going to be successful. So we really need to think about who are these people? <laughs> this is again, why we research our programming and our pre-design so much. Um, but you can see in this instance, um, this image is of a woman in a wheelchair at a kitchen countertop in an island that has been designed thinking about how can she use this island um, to prepare her meals without um, it constructing her ability to move. She can use the space. That's great. And you know what? Not only does it accommodate her specific need, but this space looks like it could accommodate a lot of people's different needs. Um, so it does, it's starting to look universal to me, but we're going to be talking about accessibility specifically. So there is this thing called the ADA, um, which is the American Disability Act, um, ADA.gov. <laughs> um, it goes into a lot of different things. So the ADA is one of those another one of those areas where interior designers have a really big impact on global ramifications. Um, but also on a really small level too, there's design standards. So um, for instance, a wheelchair, to be able to turn around, it needs a five foot clearance. Um, so if you're in a uh, accessible bathroom, and or in the stall or if it's you know a single use you just need to be able to turn your chair and have five feet of clearance to be able to successfully do so with ease um so i mean that's pretty small scale in terms of the global uh design ramifications but it's really really important um because you know what remember that instance where um there's a student in a wheelchair that can't get to the seventh floor um there's no elevator it's an old building before elevators were invented and they never updated the building, which, you know, kind of sucks for people not in wheelchairs too, because taking the stairs seven floors isn't always <laughs> the greatest either. Um, but, you know, I use the example of a wheelchair because it's like low hanging fruit when we're talking about this. Um, everybody, you know, has interacted with somebody in a wheelchair. Um, probably even been in a wheelchair at some point themselves, whether it's temporary or permanent. Um, but we can all understand the physical uh, pro hip, you know, being able to be physically impacted, but there's, there's, you know, mental health. Um, so the ADA has a definition of what's considered a disability. Um, <laughs> formal legal terms on their websites do have to use specific words. Um, it's, it's not always the um, way that people would prefer to be referred to. Um, so we need to be uh, sensitive um, to people's needs and um, the language that we use. Um, but on the left hand side, <laughs> I have listed just the beginning of a list of conditions that fit the definition of disabilities that are legally covered Americans with disabilities. So for this dude that needs to get up to his class on the seventh floor, um, yeah, his rights have been violated. Definitely, he's protected under ADA. Um, and so what he can do, since it's, it's um, a law, <laughs> uh, is he can file a lawsuit. And when that happens, it means that the building needs to update and they need to bring themselves to code. Um, anytime an old building goes into any construction, renovation, remodeling, they need to bring everything up to code. So a lot of the times you'll see old buildings not getting remodeled that much <laughs> um, because then that means they have to do a lot of changes. Um, and they won't 
always do this unless somebody sues them. Um, a lot of buildings, specifically university buildings, will wait um, until somebody has filed a lawsuit to fully do that construction work. Um, it's not the most fun thing to talk about. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry if this, you know, stings anybody. It definitely stings me, you know. And um, as designers, interior designers, architects, urban designers, um, even policymakers, we, we want these things. We want a just world. Um, but the people that own the buildings don't always... Um, you know, care about that. Maybe they're not personally impacted by it, so they're not even thinking about it. Hasn't even come across their mind um, until, you know, somebody hits them with a lawsuit. Uh, so that that's a pretty drastic example, um, but that does happen. That happens quite frequently. Um, and those lawsuits don't necessarily mean, oh, I, I'm suing you for a million dollars. It's, no, I'm, I'm suing you to put in some kind of uh, a vertical circulation that is accessible to me so I get to my classes because you're violating my rights. Um, so this, this link in green, if you click it, it will take you to the most current ADA design standards. Yes, the most current is from 2010. <laughs> uh, topic for another day. Uh, and this is the cover. So when you go to this website, you're gonna see this, but then you can scroll. Uh, and it's essentially a PDF where you can look at all of the different spaces and places and locations and what they need. They'll give you dimensions, they'll give you diagrams, they'll talk about different materials, heights for things. Um, it's really interesting to start to, to notice those things because we, you might not even notice that when you're in the bathroom, the height of the sink is a specific height. It might not be the same height as the one in your private bathroom at home. Um, and maybe that height is related to also where the hand dryer is or the baby changing is. Those are all regulated um, to be an accessible height for a variety of people, ages, children, <laughs> uh, different physical mobilities, different physical shapes and sizes, um, all of it. Even to the extent where different cultures use restrooms and spaces differently than others. Um, and so you need to think about, again, who's using this space the most and how can I make it safe for them? So um, in some parts of the world, there's, you know, to use the restroom, you don't sit necessarily on a toilet. <laughs> you squat or there's, there's different hygiene methods or grooming methods. Um, and public, large public buildings like Western need to think about those because we have students from all over the world. And if a student is not able to use um, a toilet that we've put in there, they might try to, to use it in their own way and that might not be safe. They could hurt themselves. Um, and so we need to think about how can, how can we make this comfortable um, and welcoming? So that's not necessarily an accessibility because they can still get in and use it, but it's not welcoming. It doesn't make them feel great. Um, and so it's not universal. So that's how, you know, the ADA um, and accessibility uh, and universal design have some overlaps, but they are different. And we will um, get into universal design very specifically later on in the course. So we're still in practice. This is our, our last slide for practice before we get into passion. Um, there are areas of specialization. So remember when I said the stereotype is to ask a designer if they do residential or commercial. Um, things have evolved. <laughs> um, not everybody understands the evolution of the practice. Um, so they will ask you that you're bound to get asked that. But as an interior designer, certified or not, you can go you can do a lot of th things with your career. On the left, this is a screenshot of um, something I found. It's uh, colorful in that, you know, 
uh, Japanese and Asian interior design is you specifically focus on um, that style or Zen or uh, kitchen design. Maybe you're not residential. Maybe you really focus on kitchens and bathrooms. Um, so you, you can really break it down. Um, the list, obviously this list is just for fun. On the right hand side, I continued it. Um, you can be an acquisition. So um, those uh, designers and specialists are uh, passionate about making sure the sounds of the space are at the levels where people can hear. So they're, they're really popular in designing theaters um, and music venues. And so, and also this expertise is used to price out the location of different seats. So where you can ex have the best experience um, acoustically is where they can charge the most for a seat in a theater. Um, and so having that specific specialty can is fun. If you're really interested in that, there's work for it. Um, there's designers just for lighting. Lighting, you'll have a whole class dedicated to lighting. It's, it's really important, um, not just for basic functional need and sustainability, but um, you can really create atmospheres and have fun with lighting. There's also e-design, and maybe some of you have, um, or you're, maybe you're doing e-design right now, or you've interacted with e-design. Um, it's a new you know, type of design where, I say I wanna hire an interior designer from California to uh, consult me on a color palette, and they have an e-design option on their page. Um, and so it's figuring out how you can function and offer your specialties and services to people anywhere. Um, and so you'll you have to think about how you can use the internet. What kind of technology can you use? Are using virtual reality? <laughs> A lot of different fun things can come into that. And then there's retail design, as we saw in that student's programming of the department store. There's visual merchandising. That's different than retail design because now you're thinking about um, how to sell things. You're not necessarily thinking about the experience of the shopper. You're thinking about where is the best place to put, um, you know, the main focal point of the space where people are going to be drawn to it and buy things. Um, anthropology is a really great example. They have a visual merchandising department. They're always doing new window displays. Um, they're changing up the lighting in their store. And even though it does create a beautiful um, atmosphere for the shopper, it also um, incorporates psychology that makes you want to buy things. <laughs> it supports the, the trend and the corporate bottom line. <laughs> um, but visual merchandising is is really fun. And we do have a visual merchandising degree at Western and it's um, within the fashion design and merchandising program. You can become a furniture designer, you can focus on interior architecture where you're, you, you know, doing interior design, but more architectural scale. Um, and you can do spatial design where you, you do all spaces, not just inside. Um, any space where humans interact with, you want to be a part of. So just the tip of the iceberg. There's the, and maybe you want to become a professor <laughs> um, or an entrepreneur of any kind uh, or work in a museum and curate gallery shows. There's just so many different um, things you can do with your career, things you can specialize in with your practice. Um, you have a class of professional practice on at your senior year. Well, you're, you're really getting into forming what you're going to do when you graduate. Now, oh my gosh, we're almost two hours in, but this is, you know, making up for lost time here. <laughs> and also with the new format of the class, uh, we're not limited just like to the hour lecture. Um, so passion, we're all here because we have passion. Um, and everything we're going to talk about in passion is directly relevant to the profession and practice. But this is 
this is the stuff that really like we this is what we really want to do this is what we really want to learn about most of us um and so this is a great graphic um this is a graphic from an article which i'm going to ask you to read about environmental psychology and we'll explain that at the end of the lecture but even without you know reading the labels of the brain you know i'm not a doctor i i don't know what pn means maybe you do i don't know <laughs> um uh i do know you know that is that trend of asmr and if you look at the upper right hand image of the brain you see smr so that's i mean that is a form of environmental psychology that's using sensory in the environment um and ASMR is, you know, you have a very specific idea of what it is based on the trend, but thinking about how sound and the acoustics work to please human beings is a really interesting um, thing to do. Not just a, I'm going to sit down and listen to some ASMR, you know, how can you create that pleasant sound experience throughout the whole day? Um, you can do it through form and geometry. You can do it through materiality. Lots of different ways. Um, so there's, and like we mentioned before, you can definitely cause people depression. <laughs> um, a lot of people's problems are rooted in their environments. And so while we feel like we're problem solvers, we are mostly problem creators. Um, so you, you definitely before you try to solve problems with design, you want to make sure you're not creating new ones <laughs> by overlooking them. Um, Cause there's, there's a lot of problems already and a lot of your work will be in redesigning of those old spaces. So how, how do we go about achieving environmental psychology? Obviously there's psychology classes where you can start to study the brain and how things, um, affected or you could study color theory um you can study different techniques with children or um with elderly totally i mean there's so there's so many different ways of um thinking about environmental psychology and a lot of people attribute interior design as the practice of environmental psychology or the applied research of it um but there are these things called design elements and principles. So design elements are used to achieve design principles. Um, and in this grid, I just thought this was a really great um, illustration of some design elements and principles to start the conversation. Um, you see 20 different examples of things that you would consider in design um but they they do have a logic to them um so for instance let's take line um line helps to enhance direct and create movement okay so think about that it helps to create movement all right well look at number 17 movement <laughs> create movement through blurring um motion lines and wave effects uh, so you're using lines to create movement. Um, some people debate the elements and principles because maybe movement is used to achieve something else. Um, and these aren't just applied to interior design. Every discipline has their own design elements and principles. Even when you um, sit in front of a painting, there's specific elements and principles that art historians use to analyze a painting. Um, this there's specific ones that graphic designers use for instance um there is a lot in common but there are some really specific ones for different disciplines so we're going to go through um some of these what are some in red we'll do design elements and in green we have design principles so what what do you think is the next design element if we're starting with number one um, is number two a design element, three, four, five? Um, which one of those would you consider a design element? Color. Color is an official interior design element. So is repetition and negative space. <laughs> um, transparency, yeah. 
texture, absolutely. You use texture to achieve a lot of different things. You can achieve movement by using texture. Contrast, yes. You can achieve balance with contrast, right? Framing, there's your focal point. You use framing to achieve that. Typography, this is a very graphic design specific. Typography is the word for fonts, basically. If you use font, people in art and design schools will poo-poo you <laughs> um, because typography is the, the formal graphic design rhetoric for it. Um, there's the, there's a, there, It's a psychology and study all of its own. Um, but we, I mean, we're not really going to be focused on typography right now. Um, but we are now we'll go through some of the principles. Scale. So scale, if you think about scale, when you go to a restaurant and say there's like a big open central space and then the most of the tables are booths that's around the perimeter of this open space. And maybe in the open space, it's assumed that there's dancing or some kind of performance. And so if you're on a booth, you're in the perimeter, you know, you feel like that's your designated space. But what if there was a table put in that big open space and you were eating dinner there? How would you feel? There's a scale issue because your table and your body are different uh, when it's in this big open space versus in um, a more uh, compact booth area. Maybe the ceiling's lower, there's different lighting, symmetry, balance, hierarchy. Um, I know hierarchy might seem like it's trying to achieve something. You don't want people, you don't want people to feel like one's better than the other, but it's not necessarily about that. It could be about the effect. So if you think about lights, if you want the focal point to be on the chandelier, but you also have some sconces on the walls around you, there's a hierarchy. You want the first, you know, the first emphasis to be on this, the chandelier. And there's the grid. Randomness. <laughs> so this is not an official interior design element and principle, um, but it is really important because it's extremely popular right now. Um, and it's a really effective way of thinking about design. Direction. Like I said before, when we were talking about wayfinding and signage, how you can use design to naturally bring people through a space because they'll naturally follow a path of lights. So you can use design to create that direction. Rules. Um, once you know the rules, you can break them. <laughs> um, so once you know the elements and principles, you don't need, you know, it's not the Bible. You don't need to live by these. If you know them, then you know you can know how to break them. Kind of like in the example of the column grid. Um, if you want to eliminate some of those columns, but you struck you need structure. Um, you if you know the rules, if you know the structure, if you know some structural knowledge, you can rethink how to incorporate structure in the design, um, and so you can eliminate those columns. Depth. And composition. Um, so even though it's showing composition as a page, um, you know, the composition of the magazine or of the book, um, rooms and physical spaces have compositions as well. So here's a list of the tried and true <laughs> interior design recognized elements. And here's the list of the official principles. Um, these lists are small. These are the, when somebody says design elements and principles, this is the list they're talking about. Doesn't mean the rest from this grid or even others aren't important. Everything's important in design, um, but elements and principles is just a really important foundation to get you started and to using elements and principles to then um, think about environmental psychology. So <laughs> um, now 
there's this really great TED talk. It's called the first secret to design is dot, dot, dot noticing. Um, we've talked about noticing before throughout this lecture. And I don't know if you noticed, <laughs> um, but designers notice design elements and principles when they experience, analyze and create spaces. And you might not realize you do it. Um, but this after this class and throughout this program and your career, you're going, you're going to be realizing it all the time. You're going to become an expert in noticing things others do not. And in fact, we're going to talk about um, people who do notice things that others do not and how it's impacted their life and careers. So we're going to watch um, this TED Talk now. In the great 1980s movie, The Blues Brothers, there's a scene where John Belushi goes to visit Dan Aykroyd in his apartment in Chicago for the very first time. It's a cramped, tiny space, and it's just three feet away from the train tracks. As John sits on Dan's bed, a train goes rushing by, rattling everything in the room. John asks, how often does that train go by? Dan replies, so often, you won't even notice it. And then something falls off the wall. We all know what he's talking about. As human beings, we get used to everyday things really fast. As a product designer, it's my job to see those everyday things, to feel them, and try to improve upon them. For example, see this piece of fruit? See this little sticker? That sticker wasn't there when I was a kid. But somewhere as the years passed, someone had the bright idea to put that sticker on the fruit. Why? So it could be easier for us to check out at the grocery counter. Well, that's great. We can get in and out of the store quickly. But now there's a new problem. When we get home and we're hungry and we see this ripe, juicy piece of fruit on the counter, we just want to pick it up and eat it. Except now, we have to look for this little sticker and dig at it with our nails, damaging the flesh. Then rolling up that sticker, you know what I mean, and then trying to flick it off your fingers, <laughs> right? It's not fun, not at all. But something interesting happened. See, the first time you did it, you probably felt those feelings. You just want to eat the piece of fruit, but it was, you, got, you felt upset. You just, wanted to dive in. By the 10th time, you started to become less, less upset. And you started to just do the peeling the label off. By the 100th time, at least for me, I became numb to it. I simply picked up the piece of fruit, dug at it with my nails, tried to flick it off, and then wonder, was there another sticker? <laughs> so why is that? Why do we get used to everyday things? Well, as human beings, we have limited brain power. And so our brains encode the everyday things we do into habits. So we can free up space to learn new things. It's a process called habituation. And it's one of the most basic ways as humans we learn. Now, habituation isn't always bad. Remember learning to drive? I sure do. Your hands clenched at 10 and 2 on the wheel looking at every single object out there, the cars, the lights, the pedestrians, is a nerve-wracking experience. So much so that I couldn't even talk to anyone else in the car, and I couldn't even listen to music. But then something interesting happened. As the weeks went by, driving became easier and easier. You habituated it. It started to become fun and second nature. And then you could talk to your friends again and listen to music. So there's a good reason why our brains habituate things. If we didn't, we'd notice every little detail all the time. It would be exhausting, and we'd have no time to learn about new things. But sometimes, habituation isn't good. If it stops us from noticing the problems that are around us, well, that's bad. And if it stops us from noticing and fixing those problems, well, then that's really bad. Comedians know all about this. 
Jerry Seinfeld's entire career was built on noticing those little details, those idiotic things we do every day that we don't even remember. He tells us about the time he visited his friends and he just wanted to take a comfortable shower. He'd reach out and grab the handle and turn it slightly one way and it was 100 degrees too hot. And then he'd turn it the other way and it was 100 degrees too cold. He just wanted a comfortable shower. Now we've all been there. We just don't remember it, but Jerry did, and that's a comedian's job. But designers, innovators, and entrepreneurs, it's our job to not just notice those things, but to go one step further and try to fix them. See this? This person, this is Mary Anderson. In 1902 in New York City, she was visiting. It was a cold, wet, snowy day, and she was warm inside a streetcar. As she was going to her destination, she noticed the driver opening the window to clean off the, the excess snow so he could drive safely. When he opened the window, though, he let all this cold, wet air inside, making all the passengers miserable. Now, probably most of those passengers just thought, ah, it's a fact of life. He's got to open the window to clean it. That's just how it is. But Mary didn't. Mary thought, what if the driver could actually clean the windshield from the inside so that he could stay safe and drive and the passengers could actually stay warm? So she picked out her sketchbook right then and there and began drawing what would become the world's first windshield wiper. Now, as a product designer, I try to learn from people like Mary to try to see the world the way it really is, not the way we think it is. Why? Because it's easy to solve a problem that almost everyone sees, but it's hard to solve a problem that almost no one sees. Now, some people think you're born with this ability or you're not, as if Mary Anderson was hardwired at birth to see the world more clearly. That wasn't the case for me. I had to work at it. During my years at, at Apple, Steve Jobs challenged us to come into work every day, to see our products through the eyes of the customer, the new customer, the one that has fears and possible frustrations and hopeful exhilaration that their new technology product could work straight away for them. He called it staying beginners and wanted to make sure that we focused on those tiny little details to make them faster, easier, and seamless for the new customers. So I remember this clearly in the very earliest days of the iPod. See, back in the 90s, being a gadget freak like I am, I would rush out to the store for the very, very latest gadget. I'd take all the time to get to the store, I'd check out, I'd come back home, I'd start to unbox it. And then there was another little sticker, the one that said, charge before use. What? I can't believe it. I just spent all this time buying this product and now I have to charge before use? I have to wait what felt like an eternity to use that coveted new toy? It was crazy. But you know what? Almost every product back then did that. When it had batteries in it, you had to charge it before you used it. Well, Steve noticed that. And he said, we're not gonna let that happen to our product. So what did we do? Typically, when you have a product that has a hard drive in it, you run it for about 30 minutes in the factory to make sure that hard drive is going to be working years later for the customer after they pull it out of the box. What did we do instead? We ran that product for over two hours. Why? Well, first off, we could make a higher quality product, be easy to test and make sure it was great for the customer. But most importantly, the battery came fully charged right out of the box, ready to use. So that customer could just, with all that, that exhilaration, could just start using the product. It was great and it worked. People liked it. Now today, almost every product that you get that's battery powered comes out of the box fully charged, even if it doesn't have a hard drive. But back then, we noticed that, that detail and we fixed it. And now everyone else does that as well. No more charge before use. So why am I telling you this? Well, it's seeing the invisible problem, not just the obvious problem. 
that's important, not just for product design, but for everything we do. You see, there are invisible problems all around us, ones we can solve. But first, we need to see them, to feel them. So I'm hesitant to give you any tips about neuroscience or psychology. There's far too many experienced people in the TED community who will know much more about that than I ever will. But let me leave you with a few tips that I do, that we all can do, to fight habituation. My first tip is to look broader. You see, when you're tackling a problem, sometimes there are a lot of steps that lead up to that problem, and sometimes a lot of steps after it. If you can take a step back and look broader, maybe you can change some of those boxes before the problem. Maybe you can combine them. Maybe you can remove them all together to make that better. Take thermostats, for instance. In the 1900s, when they first came out, they were really simple to use. You could turn them up or turn them down. People understood them. But in the 1970s, the energy crisis struck, and customers started thinking about how to save energy. So what happened? Thermostat designers decided to add a new step. Instead of just turning up and down, you now had to program it so you could tell it the temperature you wanted at a certain time. Now, that seemed great. Every thermostat had started adding that feature. But it turned out that no one saved any energy. Now, why is that? Well, people couldn't predict the future. They just didn't know how their weeks would change season to season, year to year. So no one was saving energy. And what happened? Thermostat designers went back to the drawing board, and they focused on that programming step. They made better UIs. They made better documentation. But still, years later, people were not saving any energy because they just couldn't predict the future. So what do we do? We put a machine learning algorithm in instead of the programmer that would simply watch when you turned it up and down, when, when you liked a certain temperature when you got up or when you went away. And you know what? It worked. People are saving energy without any programming. So it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you take a step back and look at all the boxes, maybe there's a way to remove one or combine them so you can make that process much simpler. So that's my first tip, look broader. For my second tip, it's to look closer. One of my greatest teachers was my grandfather. He taught me all about the world. He taught me how things were built and how they were repaired, the tools and techniques necessary to make a successful project. I remember one story he told me about screws and about how you need to have the right screw for the right job. There were many different screws, wood screws, metal screws, anchors, concrete screws. The list went on and on. Our job is to make products that are easy to install for all of our customers themselves without professionals. So what did we do? I remembered that story that my grandfather told me. And so we thought, how many different screws could we put in the box? Was it going to be two, three, four, five? Because there's so many different wall types. So we thought about it, we optimized it, and we came up with two different, three different screws to put in the box. We thought that was going to solve the problem, but it turned out it didn't. So we shipped it, shipped the product, and people weren't having a great experience. So what did we do? We went back to the drawing board just instantly after we figured out we didn't get it right. And we designed a special screw, a custom screw, much to the chagrin of our investors. They were like, why are you spending so much time on a little screw? Get out there and sell more. And we said, we will sell more if we get this right. And it turned out we did. With that custom little screw, there was just one screw in the box. It was easy to mount and put on the wall. So if we focus on those tiny details, the ones we might or that we may not see, and we look at them and we say, are those important or, the, or, or is that the way we've always done it? Maybe there's a way to get rid of those. So my last piece of advice is to think younger. Every day, I'm confronted with interesting questions for my three young kids. They come up with questions like, why can't cars fly around traffic? 
Or why don't my shoelaces have Velcro instead? Sometimes those questions are smart. My son came to me the other day and I asked him, hey, go run out to the mailbox and check it. He looked at me, puzzled, and said, why doesn't the mailbox just check itself and tell us when it has mail? I was like, that's a pretty good question. So they can ask tons of questions. And sometimes we find out we just don't have the right answers. We say, son, that's just the way the world works. So the more we're exposed to something, the more we get used to it. But kids haven't been around long enough to get used to those things. And so when they run into problems, they tr immediately try to solve them. And sometimes they find a better way. And that way really is better. So my advice, and that we take to heart, is to have young people on your team or people with young minds. Because if you have those young minds, they cause everyone in the room to think younger. Picasso once said, every child is an artist. The problem is, is when he or she grows up, is how to remain an artist. We all saw the world more clearly when we saw it for the first time, before a lifetime of habits got in the way. Our challenge is to get back to there, to feel that frustration, to see those little details, to look broader, look closer, and to think younger, so we can stay beginners. It's not easy. It requires us pushing back against one of the most basic ways we make sense of the world. But if we do, we can do some pretty amazing things. For me, hopefully that's better product design. For you, that could mean something else, something powerful. Our challenge is to wake up each day and say, how can I experience the world better? And if we do, maybe, just maybe, we can get rid of these dumb little stickers. Thank you very much. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting what he had to say about noticing things. Um, as I mentioned before, you're going to start noticing the world differently. The more knowledge you um, learn about space, about how people use space, about how our brains interpret space, about social justice in space, um, you're going to notice things that you didn't notice before. Um, and the world is going to open up for you a lot differently. Um, as he said, it's exhausting. <laughs> so, so remember, um, designers use design elements to achieve design principles. So as a, as an interior designer, you're going to start to use design elements and principles to notice things because they're in every space that we're in, um, negative or positive. <laughs> um, and so this is an image of different elements of design. Um, a little bit more specifically interior design or spatial design than the last illustration. Um, and so here again is the list of elements and they have been connected to their correlation of an image that represents them and then a few different definitions. Um, so I will let you go back to this page in the PDF that's posted on eLearning and read on all of those. Uh, chapter three in your book is also all about design elements and principles. Um, and so your next assignment, your first assignment will require you to know the definitions and understand the definitions and apply them. Um, and so I'm not going to elaborate too much on that because that is going to be a more hands on um, circumstance. Then you have the principles of design and the principles are listed here on the right. Again, correlated with an image and a definition of them. Um, so you can, you can look at this later. I'll read chapter three and start to look around your space and see um, if it feels balanced and why. What's contributing towards that feeling of balance? Um, 
is there a rhythm? Potentially. Um, yeah. So look, look around your space and start noticing things and read up on the design elements and principles because they're going to be important in the next assignment and future assignments. And so another reason we're all here, something we all love, we have a passion, is for textiles, finishes, fabrics, materials, um, you know, any, any, any type of, not just adornment, but something that really uh, marries function with that sensory experience. Um, so obviously we need flooring. <laughs> um, but now you can think about the experience of the floor, the visual experience of it. Maybe you have to think about acoustics. So the flooring material needs to incorporate that. Um, maybe you you're in an area where there's water and you don't want people to slip. So you need to think about the texture of the floor and what is going to help prevent people from slipping. I um, mean, slips happen regardless, but there are materials meant to um, decrease that likelihood. Um, so on this page, I have assembled some mood boards. Um, and these are mood boards because they don't necessarily introduce a design concept to a project yet, but they are a designer's way of expressing how a space feels. So in the bottom three images, starting from the right, um, you see basically the inner workings of a designer's mind. Um, whether these are beautifully composed and made into posters, or maybe they're just on a piece of paper and you're taping different materials together or you're pinning them up on the wall um, because they inspire you. Um, they both they both count. They're both that equally as important. Um, and so on the right-hand side, you can see that this designer uh, pulled out a sketchbook and just started drawing um, ideas for how, you know, some of the furniture elements and the uh, line work and the detail work and the finish of that furniture and how it's incorporating the space. Um, they're also thinking about lighting and other elements within the space. And you can see that they're bringing together those elements and um, putting them in a composition so you can start to feel a space. It, it, it's a visual, it's like when you read music, you can, if you can read music, then you can kind of hear it. Um, but when you look at this, you can feel it um, to some extent. Uh, and as you design your own spaces and you create your own mood boards, your ability to feel how that is going to feel in real life um, is going to increase because it really starts from expressing yourself. And then you can start to um, become a little bit more aware and empathetic of how other people will feel. But you also need to know what's triggering to other people. So if you're presenting a mood board to somebody, you know, who has PTSD from being in the war and you're presenting um, specific materials or colors um, or lighting fixtures that um, may have negative connotations to them. So things to, things to think about. Um, when, when we start assigning specific clients other than ourselves. <laughs> um, and then in the middle here, the, the large mood board before you get to the pen and ink sketch, um, this is actually one step removed from the, um, compilation of materials. You're still getting the mood. You're getting, you're definitely getting a color scheme, but they're introducing texture as opposed to finishes because the finishes don't necessarily matter. It's more or less the, the textures and the sensory experience they evoke. So this designer um, might not have known. I don't know the finishes. I just know how I want people to feel. I want that feeling of when you look really close at a petal and you can see the delicate layers of the soft texture. I know I want that feeling. Um, and so in the upper hand corner, there's an image of that. You know, I know I want that, that beachy raw wood with white. I want that feeling of 
the West Coast casual comforts. Um, I want that feeling of these naturally made elements in life, like the shells. Obviously, you're probably not going to, you know, glue shells to your finishes, um, but they create a feeling and they start to create a language and people can respond to that. It's a way of, um, push, you know, bouncing your ideas off of other people or communicating with your client. And then on the far left, there are some pen and ink um, drawings of different textures and finishes. So when we draw, um, we, as you can see in the drawing of the furniture at the bottom, um, we, we have to uh, identify, you know, materials and textures and finishes. When you draw a floor plan, you'll eventually be needing to um, communicate what type of flooring is going to be on it. And, and in a floor plan view, you're going to see that. Um, so we need to learn how to um, properly communicate different materials and finishes. Um, and there are universal symbols and methods to doing so. And so um, digitally, these are preloaded. <laughs> I mean, if you're doing a really, really unique custom pattern, you would have to do that. But um, most of these pochets, <laughs> we call them pochets, um, are digitally um, done already. So if you're drawing in, like in CAD, you can apply the materials or the textures. We're going to be working with hand primarily. Um, and also in 1490, this is going to come up again. So we're going to have to learn how to properly use our hand to communicate depth and balance and movement all through the textures because each one of these has a value that it brings to the project you're using it for a specific reason like for instance there's one that has a sand effect so you want to if you want to create that movement and that feeling doing it in through this way also creates that you could superimpose that little square of the sand effect on to the mood board right next to it and it would fit because it matches but it's it's not really that specific um, to any specific type of design here is an example of um, the, these are borderline mood and concept boards um, that I did a few years back for a client of a bathroom remodel on the left hand side you see the bathroom the master bathroom and on the right hand side you see the main bathroom so they lived in a hundred year old um craftsman home and they are both um they both love traveling to asia and they wanted to incorporate some of the furniture and pieces that they already own um some lighting fixtures different lighting techniques um things from their travels and the experience and so i without even interviewing um, this client or dissecting them, you know, I met with them in their house and I could observe how they live in their style. And I, I took a shot in the dark and made a guess of some of the things that they would be interested in. And I put these boards together. I took in everything they told me and then I, I put these boards together and then I gave it to them. Um, and I included paragraphs under most of it because um, a client is reading it when I'm not there. <laughs> uh, and so I want these to be standalone. Um, and these are a little bit more specific than just mood because now we're talking about actual materials and material qualities that enhance the experience we're trying to go for. And in fact, the image at, in the bottom left of those closet doors, that drove the whole project. She saw that. And suddenly she wanted doors and all finishes to have this combination of marble and veneer and metal. Um, and it, it began to really um, drive the project. And that's great. So any type of visual you can provide to that somebody can identify with or they love or it just it 
represent something that's in their head that they're having trouble communicating, that's great. And our skill, and in fact, our passion is compiling these things, putting together the story. Um, so what what's going to match these closet doors? And how am I going to create the story? And thinking about um, her husband and how he likes to read before he takes a shower and kind of wants a bench to do that and how are they going to all relate to each other um so just i just wanted to throw an example of you know i am a working interior designer and architect so i wanted to show some examples of real work um and then after those concept boards there was a next step of drawing the floor plans. This floor plan has both bathrooms. Um, you can see the two showers are back to back. Um, one bathroom you enter in through the master bath and the other um, you enter through a hallway. Um, and so we created this floor plan and it allowed them to take what they saw on the concept board and say, okay, yep, I'm gonna be standing at this mirror and I'm gonna be able to see these closet doors <laughs> and this is how it's going to feel. And this was a concept floor plan, but this ended up being the final floor plan. I mean, obviously um, a more detailed floor plan was developed, but this concept was a, a one and done. <laughs> they liked it, they wanted to keep it. Um, and so it, it was altered a little bit for construction and um, spaces and as we you know picked out the tub and the toilets and everything like that you know the dimensions of things kind of changed a little bit um but they they this was a it i think the concept board sold the floor plan i don't think that feeling could have been communicated in the floor plan alone if it was just black and white potentially but a lot of people struggle to read floor plans um and maybe you're one of those people right now, but you're gonna become an expert at not only reading them, <laughs> but analyzing them and producing them yourself. So there's another, there's one other area of our passion and that's with applied research. Um, interior design is applied research. You know, in that pre-design phase, we do so much research on materials, on our clients, on, you know, everything, <laughs> psychology, <laughs> um, we notice things, um, but it's a very detailed profession. And so for every project, we, we apply our research, we do research and design is being able to take that data, those articles we read, those studies we've come across, previous case studies and learning from them and applying them to a design. And so here is an example of a pre-design package that a student, a sophomore student did last year for a residential architecture studio. Um, I just took a few pages to get the, the point across. Um, the first page is the client research. We worked with a nonprofit um, who was developing um, very custom, affordable housing made out of reclaimed materials and prefabricated materials. Um, and so this specific student was really interested in using recycled reclaimed materials um, and specifically cork. So cork in and of itself is a fairly sustainable material, but she took it one step further and was like, how can I acquire recycled cork? <laughs> um, and so she researched it and she found out where locally or you know regionally she can get this, the benefits of it, the challenges of it. Um, how can you figure out the type of inventory before you start sourcing it? So it's really easy to say, oh, recycled cork. But what if it, you can't find that recycled cork? You kind of need to know that it exists <laughs> before you uh, place it in there. Um, and so this these pages show um, some of that thought process that she did, she listed, and this is, again, is not the, the uh, design boards um, or anything. This was a compilation of her research. Um, so it looks very much like, you know, a research book. Uh, and so she 
thought about potential applications in her project and she listed them. Um, and then she looked um, into examples of other projects that use it. And so these are called precedent studies. So she found an example of cork application in another project that had a similar design concept that she was interested in. Now, mind you, using cork, using recycled cork is not the design concept. Um, she had a much larger um, goal and concept in mind, and she was using recycled cork to achieve it. Um, and so this precedent that she looked at did just that. So she analyzed it and she learned from it and she was able to understand what worked, what didn't, and how to apply that to her project. Um, and I wanna just take this moment to differentiate the difference between a case study and a precedent because you know, theoretically they are the same thing and we do use those terms interchangeably. Um, a case study is an example of how a project achieved a goal. So you want to understand more specific technicalities. So um, say you, <laughs> you are interested in using solar panels and you found a case study of an interior designer who used solar panels in the window. Um, so your case study is how did they do that? What technology did they use? How did they make it successful? Um, a precedent is an example of a concept or an idea. And so your design concept might be maybe about making spaces that are child friendly, um, where there's a less likelihood for them to be injured. Maybe it's a little bit more universal for different um, neurological developments. Um, and so, and I, I'm not saying that that was her concept. I'm saying that's a potential concept. Um, and so she wanted to use cork to, you know, on the flooring in that type of scenario. Um, and so she showed a project of a place that used cork flooring to achieve a similar intention, um, maybe kid friendly type of flooring. Um, and then here's uh, last last page of the applied research. Um, which also includes demographic research. So we, we talked about how important it is to really get to know your client on every level possible. But um, even though we do focus on that first third, you know, in the um, spaces, places, and policy diagram, we do get, we do need to understand the demographic of the communities that we're working in um, because you, you do need to be appropriate. Um, and you want to know what demographic your client fits into, um, not to judge them or to classify them per se, but just so you can understand. Um, so for example, um, we, you know, we are working with a nonprofit to create, um, affordable small housing. Um, and so we wanted to know what the demographic of the, you know, the zip codes that this nonprofit works with. And we found that... 90% of the community um, doesn't have a college degree. For it, That's just one example of research. So we can say, okay, so the likelihood that our client does not, in this area, who's being served by this nonprofit, does not have a college degree is high. So what, how can design, you know, um, enhance that or, or motivate or support or how, what is that, say about the individual that we can make their lives better through design. There's a lot of different um, ways and things to learn from demographic research, whether it's socioeconomics, whether it's um, who, like, are there elementary school students? Are there retirement homes? <laughs> um, are there farms? Where are people working? How far do they travel for work? Do they walk to work? Do they drive? Um, what's the racial makeup of the area? There's, I mean, demographic can be divided into so many different things. And depending on your design concept and your design ideas, um, you may want to kind of select the demographic that's important to you. So for 
child friendly cork floors. Um, this student may have wanted to look into demographic of the children in the area, um, child care facilities, um, where do children go to play? You know, maybe if there's no daycares or play facilities, that helps you understand this child is going to be in this space a lot, more than usual. Um, this is, this space is going to be um, used for a lot of different functions. So, I mean, a, an example of applied research would be taking that and um, doing multiple different types of floors to sort of represent and symbolize different times of the day or different uses. We do this naturally. So, you know, bedrooms, carpeted, <laughs> kitchens, tile. Um, they, they're functional that way, but it, it also helps our brains in like wayfinding and understanding what the space is used for. Um, and that's especially true for children. They're even lower to the floor. Um, so those slight texture differences or color differences are going to have a big impact on their quality of life, um, and what they do in different spaces. So you could, you could really have fun with it and like really stimulate the child, have some places where they're going to read, where they're going to play a lot of different things. So, um, and then this student selected a potential scenario because at this point, we were working with the nonprofit, but she did not have a specific client. We had to work with the assumption of the demographic, um, which which happens often in design. Um, and so she made a realistic um, scenario and applied her concept to it and ran through some iterations of what does that mean for the project. So when she did have a better idea of who she was designing for specifically, she knew, she had research to back it up that she could apply to that. Um, and then this last page is our concept research. So she has her formal design concept listed. She has some representational images um, and then like what she's gonna learn. And again, this was her pre-designed package that would later inform her official concept design. Um, and so, you know, this is before the design even began. This is all that research. So that, that uh, takes care of the majority of our lecture. We just have a few slides, which is um, your homework and going over a few things. So your first assignment is to read the first three chapters in your textbook. If you have not acquired your textbook yet, I am going to load a PDF of these three chapters onto e-learning so you have them. Um, but for future chapters, you will need your book. Um, and then there's also an article titled A Factor Analysis of Health, Safety, and Welfare in the Built Environment. I would like you to read that. I would also like you to read Psychology of Space, How Interiors Impact Our Behavior. Again, we, I referenced these articles in the lecture and I used some of the images so they'll be familiar. They're really interesting. Um, but then I'd like you to partic participate in the discussion board, which I am going to begin after posting this on e-learning. Um, your responsibility minimally is to make three comments, not all at the same time, you know, it's a discussion. So I want you to ask questions and respond to other students and um, create some meaningful conversations. I will start the discussion board but with a few selected questions about the readings, about the lecture, about your feelings towards certain things um, for you to respond to. And then you can respond to other classmates' um, posts as well. And then um, assignment one is being assigned today. It's on e-learning under assignments. Um, as well as the introduction page. So what is assignment one? It's your home workspace. So your assignment is to evaluate the space where you are working right now. Um, I'm just going to assume it's home, but you know, it's any space where you're working um, remotely. What, why did you choose that space? So where, you say you're in your, your parents' house. Um, why did you choose to locate your workspace 
there? You know, why are you in the corner of your bedroom? Why are you on the dining table? I know these might sound obvious, um, but really get into it because there's things probably that you noticed that you didn't notice, you noticed. <laughs> or, you know, kind of that like subconscious decisions. Maybe it, there's natural light. You didn't even realize, I like this because there's natural light. Or, <laughs> you know, I, I like the way that it smells. <laughs> there's different, different things. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be just functional, like, oh, it's the largest table. It's where the plug is so I can plug my computer in. Um, so start noticing those. So your task is to design your home workplace, incorporating three of the design elements and two of the design principles from the you know, official interior design elements and principles, which is all of chapter three. Um, your design must include the backdrop or the surrounding of your camera. So when, when we meet live virtually and I'm looking at you, what am I seeing behind you? So it's sort of like common to meet with people and the lighting's terrible or like the angle is bad or it's like really um, chaotic in the background. But as emerging professionals, um, you wanna be professional. You want to have a professional backdrop. Um, doesn't have to be super complex. You know, it doesn't have to be a stage. Um, but it should be intentional and thought out and, you know, frame your face, frame what you want to be seen from the camera and have it represent who you are as a person and your identity, have it capture who you are. Um, so any types of objects, some people are, you know, they want to be by a bookcase so they can have the books. It has a nice texture. It says a lot about them if they love reading. Um, it's not too distracting from their, you know, full camera view. But how can you complement and represent yourself through the design of your workspace? So um, the second, you know, the other part of this assignment is not just doing the backdrop, but actually doing the whole workspace, however big it is. Um, think about it, arrange it bubble diagram it, um, you know, show your thought process, your deliverable. Deliverable is what is actually due, what is actually being graded. Um, so you have to do a live three minute presentation to the class delivered virtually, of course, we're going to have scheduled times, um, which currently aren't scheduled now, but they will be scheduled by Friday. Um, this will also serve as your introduction to the class. So you can introduce yourself, your name, where you're from. The, the place where you're from might be different than the place where you are right now, or maybe not. Um, where is your workspace located? Uh, tell the class a few defining factors about yourself. This is you know, probably the first time you're um, interacting with your other interior design classmates. Um, that you know of. <laughs> you might have interacted with them and didn't know that. But, um, and then explain the design elements and principles that you selected and why. Totally up to you to select. Um, again, elements achieve principles, but the principles and the elements support the concept, um, which means that you need to have a design concept. So, um, grading criteria. This assignment is worth 100 points. Um, there's four main categories and each category is worth 25 points. The first is, did you establish a design concept for your space? So you may have established a design concept, but if you didn't communicate it during your three minute presentation, um, I'm going to have to assume from what I see but it's not greatest to have people assume for you. So you'll wanna, you don't need to have a super formal design concept statement, but you're gonna wanna outright tell the class what you wanna achieve and why. Um, and then did you successfully use design elements um, to achieve the principles? And then did you explain how your design elements and principle selections contribute to your design concept? So tell us, you know, what those elements and principles, why, 
Why did you use them? And how are they supporting this concept? Um, and then number four, does your backdrop represent or complement your identity that you presented to us? And I know some of these um, might not be like super, super obvious. And we are limited to very small spaces and very small camera backdrop and maybe even just a desk. So your workspace in and of itself, the square footage you take up in your space might be small. It could be big. You might have a whole room, <laughs> like an office. Um, and so that that's going to all be a part of it. So if you are working with just a desk, maybe you want your backdrop to be a little bit more open. Um, and, you know, you don't want your space to be overly cluttered. Uh, but you don't want to look like you're, you know, sitting against a bathroom wall or something. Uh, you still want it to be professional. So what, pretend we're your clients. How would you present yourself to your clients? You're going to have a virtual meeting and meet a potential client that you want them to hire you. What, how do you, you know, a d interior designers can be crazy and be creative and we can, we can have tattoos and we can color our hair, whatever we want, and we can have any hairstyle and dress the way we want. Um, because it supports who we are and our design, what we believe in. There's really no, um, s single right way of doing things as long as it's intentional. So many students are still registering into the course, believe it or not. Um, on Friday, I'm really hoping that's everything's going to settle down by Friday. Really hope everybody would be, you know, fully registered for what they need to be by Friday. Um, your scheduled presentation uh, schedules will be assigned and it's going to happen during week three. So about a week from now, um, I will primarily schedule you during your design communication in-person meeting time because at current you have that set aside and it's open and it's available. For those of you who are not in design communication, which I really don't think any of you are, but for those of you who are not, I will um, make sure that you are put in a time slot that works for you. Um, and then I will um, also be using this as an opportunity to see everyone's workspace and what materials and supplies will be needed for future assignments. Um, like I mentioned before, we have a list of supplies that I have not distributed yet. Um, I want to see what everybody's surroundings are like. And a lot of those supplies are specific to the um, studio classroom at school, which um, so we are extending one more week and remote. And um, the COVID counts are increasing at Western. Um, so faculty is, is on warning <laughs> is on watch. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if we went completely remote within a week or, a, or two weeks. So I, I don't want to have you go out and buy supplies that you won't be using this semester. Not that you won't be using them in future semesters, but, um, everything's so expensive. I, I want to make sure you're using what you buy this semester. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to see what you have. <laughs> how big is your workspace? That tells me how big pa of paper that you can draw on. Um, do you have a round table or a square? This is going to tell me how and what you need to do to create straight lines, et cetera. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to assess that. Um, and for those of you in, in design communication too, um, obviously that course requires more drawing and formalized drafting. Um, and so you're going to have a sister assignment to this one. They're going to, um, complement each other and build off of each other. Uh, and I'm going to be able to interpret your space even more, uh, for those specific tools in that class. And so this introduction page, um, so this is on, this is posted on e-learning. It's in a Word doc and I'd like you to fill it out in the Word doc and resave it and submit it in a Word doc. Um, really it's just me knowing who you are <laughs> and, uh, what you're about. So what is your name? What do you want to be called? What's your preferred nickname? What are your pronouns? 
What are your interests? Put anything. Don't think it just means interior design. Um, do you work outside of school? And if so, um, how many hours on average do you work? If applicable. So I know a lot of people work and have essential jobs or they're at risk or they have different circumstances. Um, and I, I do really like to know um, what's going on in everybody's life because that does take up a, a significant amount of time. Um, and it's just, it's good to know where your time is being spent so I can plan appropriately as well. If you have <laughs> something, uh, if you're not working, but you have something comparable, like maybe you're a caretaker for a sick relative or something like that, um, include that here as well. If it's a significant part of your week. Um, and then what do you want to take away from this course? Literally could be anything. Don't think you need to choose from a list of topics. Just really genuinely, why did you sign up for this class? Why do you want to pursue interior design? And then what do you think will be the most difficult for you in this course? And I understand that remote learning and online classes <laughs> will probably be number one. So let's just assume that's going to be difficult for all of us. Um, and put something else, put something, you know, related to the curriculum of the class down. Um, this interior design is difficult, but some things come easier for people. Some people can draw really well, but when it comes to like analyzing square footages and, uh, programming, they need more help and it's vice versa. And, um, I, normally see your, you know, I see you in person, I see your work developing. I don't always see that to the same extent here that I would. So I would naturally see your strengths and weaknesses. And I will throughout the course, but I'm just curious what you would say they are right now, having no experience or very little experience. So this is the last page of the, the show, three hours. <laughs> That's, um, that that will uh you know think about how you would have an hour lecture and then um one hour of in class course time plus the homework that you would have so so this will be um sufficient uh in terms of content i'm providing you for the week um i do still want to talk to you to meet you to see what you're working on answer your questions um be around for you and so we will work through those things. Uh, reach out to me as you need me. I will reach out to you. Um, I'm going to start, you know, organizing schedules and posting things on e-learning. I'll be monitoring the discussion board and probably I can't help myself. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be talking in there too. Um, and so we'll, we're going to try to really stay connected. Um, and we'll see how this week goes, what worked, what didn't, um, what you liked, what you didn't like, and uh, we'll we'll improve every week after from there. So make sure you are noting noticing <laughs> um, how you feel about things, and please always provide constructive feedback um, for the betterment of all students and for me. So I hope you're having a good week. I will be putting everything on e-learning. And I will talk to you guys later. Thank you for attending the first of the Lecture and Learn series.